Hello, everybody. It is 8.02 in Brussels. It is 1 p.m. in Central Time in the U.S. And this is a Wizard of Ox Live. And I'm Patricia, and my co-wizards are here with me, Carla Wiersma from Colorado and Monique Attinger from Canada, from Toronto. Mm -hmm. So today, ah, we have Kelly, which is our awesome moderator. She's going to be joining us on video for a little while. And um, we're going to be talking today about the great adventure of lowering oxalate. Slowly. <laughs> Slowly, slowly, yeah. slowly, not in a rush, just going, following the rhythm of your own body. And how are you going to be able to use the resources in the group, use the, um, the spreadsheet and the recipes and everything to lower your oxalate intake, you know, where you are and not just follow blindly the directions of low oxalate. For most of you, if you're coming in from spinach world, you're gonna be coming from very, very high oxalate levels. So you do not start with a 40 to 60 milligram uh, oxalate level per day. So I'm gonna let uh, my beautiful co-host today, keep uh, keep going, but that's what we're going to be talking about. If you have any questions, type them up in the chat and I'll be following them up. So Monique or Carla, you're on. Okay, well, I can jump in. Um, I'll just suggest uh, that we should make sure that everybody's muted so that we don't get too much background noise. I think we have, I think we have somebody who's still unmuted of our attendees. Okay, perfect. All right, so lowering oxalate. It should be a more nuanced process than it was when I did it. So I think, I think my fellow um, uh, co-host here will agree that most of us, when you're talking more than a decade ago, were lowering oxalate much too quickly. And so, some of what we experienced is why we suggest lowering more slowly now. So the faster you're taking your oxalate level down, the more likely when oxalate dumping gets going, it's going to be intense. And if your health is already more fragile or you have some kind of a significant diagnosis or, you know, a lot of inflammation already existing in your body. When that oxalate starts to move, it gets one more shot at you as it's exiting. And this is part of the reason why we do have to be more nuanced when it comes to taking down our oxalate level. Um, in our case, we weathered it okay, but there are definitely people who have been members of the Trying Low Oxalates group who went low really quickly and then ended up with various kinds of issues, including ending up in ER and things like that. So we really want to caution you. While the people on the group will often be encouraging you to look at, you know, substituting a low oxalate food for something that you might still be eating that's higher, if you're in the process of reducing your oxalate, file that information for later, okay? So if you come into this diet like I did, where I was eating most days, I was having spinach, I was eating almonds, I was having beets regularly. We were eating things like rhubarb. We were doing all these really high oxalate foods. If you're coming into this diet from those kinds of levels of intake, while you may be able to handle a fair bit of a drop, like maybe you can cut out one food at a time if you're not eating it every day. But at some point, you're going to have to stop doing that and be a little more nuanced. So I think part of what we want to talk about today is how you can be more nuanced, how you can take a really high oxalate recipe down through steps so that you're slowly coming down and, and just approach the diet with a little bit more uh, finesse than what any of your moderators here 
were doing at the time when we did it. So, um, you know, the other thing that we can talk about as well is another approach that I take sometimes with people who are now lowering their oxalate, which is a kind of look at a baseline low oxalate diet and how to kind of easily do that. And then add-ins, which will give you a bump up of oxalate intermittently. So there are more than one way, but if you're coming from really, really, really high oxalate intake, you may need to like slowly bring that down a little bit before you can even get to my, I'm going to call it a hybrid approach where you've got this baseline low oxalate diet and you've got add-ins. So we'll be able to talk about both those things, but that's my introduction for, for what we want to cover today. I will hop in and, and agree. When we started the diet 14 plus years ago, I was not aware of the Low Oxley Cookbook. There was a website that essentially said, you know, these are your high ingredients, these are your low ingredients, these are your medium ingredients. They really didn't give numbers other than you know, this is over 15 milligrams. So that makes it high. This is, you know, five to 14. So that makes it medium. And then five and under, you know, you're low. You know, without saying, you know, giving, giving more specifics. I started the diet before my son did. He was the reason that I got into it in the first place. I went essentially cold turkey. You know, how bad can it be? Yeah, it was bad. Not so bad that I ended up in the ER, although we, we did have a few members in the Yahoo group that did, that were just in excruciating pain. My diet was probably, I'd say, 300 to 350. So it wasn't, you know, it was high, but some of these guys were, were probably 500 plus. But, you know, even going from 300 to, let's say, roughly 60 was, was not pleasant, to put it mildly. When I started throwing higher oxalate items back in after a, about a week of, of being in serious discomfort, you know, the husband was like, thank you, because I, I was fixing to beat you with the broom that you flew in on. That's, that's about how miserable I was. I, I was in, I, I would say, considerable pain, not agony, but I wasn't a real happy camper, and I was spreading that love around. So when I started my son on a diet, I was a lot more cautious in it wasn't all that pleasant for him, but I think it was a lot less, you know, a lot less unpleasant than it was when I did it. So one of the things that we had talked about earlier is, you know, we mentioned, you know, you need to to go slow, 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 especially, you know, if you have a very high oxalate diet. How do you do that? You know, if you look on our group, our recipes are, are pretty much all low to medium oxalate. Well, if you're starting out at 500 plus milligrams a day, you ain't going to be using those unless you want to be in some serious pain. So how do we get you, you know, to step down? How do we help you step down gradually? That's, that's what we're here to talk about. Absolutely. And I'm going to talk just for a second for those people that are just getting started and I'm trying to figure out what on earth are oxalates and what do they do and, you know, what's happening here and why do I need to do it slowly? A lot of the diets that you've probably been into or, uh, or that you have seen, even if you haven't tried them, are all or nothing. So you go gluten free and you remove all gluten. You go casing free, you remove all casing and you don't take any. 
then you go keto and you do not do carbs. And then you do, you know, then you do another uh, vegetarian diet and you only do eggs and, and dairy. And if you go vegan, you don't do any animals. So it's kind of like an all or nothing. And, um, and that's the way people usually uh, take the notion of a specialty diet. You know, even if you have, you know, my dad, when he was having kidney problems, it was like no salt, you know, do no, so do, do no, no salt, no potassium, no this, no that. And it was an all or nothing type of diet. Now, oxalate is a different thing. Oxalate is a toxin that, that is a part of many plants. And normally, in a perfect situation, we would have, we would be eating just a small amount of different plants because we would be eating a great variety of foods. So, you know, like, like a whole consumption or daily consumption of oxalate in previous times would be relatively low. And then you would have a perfect gut microbiome that would allow you to break up all of this oxalate and let it go or have it go through your kidneys and your kidneys will be happy because we'll be drinking tons of pure water and lots of things and it will be going out very easily. Now, the situation is not that not right now. And we've been eating less and less varied in as, as a modern Western society, I would say. You know, you always find the same foods in the supermarket and you find them all year round. And many of them that are considered very, very healthy. So your spinach, your almonds, your soy, your veggie uh, milks, all those things, you know, those are relatively new foods. And we were never meant to eat spinach in February or strawberries in January. So um, that's, that's one of the things. So we start absorbing all these things. We've gone through courses of antibiotics or other insults in our gut that changes that flora. And so we're taken out of this mechanism that used to be able to adjust what was happening with the oxalate that we were eating. So this is a different type of reason why we're doing a diet. And it's a toxin. So it's going to accumulate. Your body has no need for it. Doesn't know what to do with it. It's going to start sticking it wherever it goes. We already talked about that it will get stuck with there's inflammation. And uh, so when it's coming out, it's still a toxin and it's still going to become a stress to your body. And that's why we have to go slow. You do not want to surpass your body's capacity. And it's very easy to do if you go from three cups of spinach to none. You know, the drop in the oxalate level will be massive. And then your body would go, okay, there's this different in concentration. So let me get, you know, let me get rid of some of that so that all of this gets, um, gets out of my system and I maintain this, this concentration. And then that's when trouble starts. So I'll shut up. I'll let these beautiful ladies continue. <laughs> well, I'm just going to jump on and surf with what Patricia started to say here, because um, we haven't said the word inflammasome, but I do want to say that in part because more research is coming out recently that talks about how oxalate sets up the inflammasome and kicks it off and gets it going. So if you've got inflammation that already exists, you've got oxalate moving out of your system, it's going to keep that inflammation going because it, it stimulates and triggers the inflammasome being set up. And that's right down at the cellular level, the small little organelle that produces the inflammatory response, which is productive if it resolves properly, but oxalate helps it to keep going in a non-productive way. And it's that inflammatory driver. It's the physical damage that can be done if you've got oxalate that's met up with a mineral and becomes an insoluble 
oxalate crystal of whatever size, and that can be disruptive in joints and so on. So we've talked about some of these things before, but the problem of oxalate moving out of your system is this stuff as it goes is just as inflammatory and just as damaging as when it came in. And so we want it to leave, but in an orderly fashion. So unlike a stampede, which can cause damage, if you want to go to a really simple, easy analogy, unlike a stampede, we want an orderly exit. And lowering slowly is part of what gives you this orderly exit, as opposed to um, a bigger push with you know, some signaling that we don't know about yet, whatever characterizes oxalate dumping, we have limited information on that. But we can tell from all three of us being um, admins on the Triangle Oxalate Support Group for many years now, that clearly if you drop it too quickly, you get the stampede. And that is not what you want. So we were we were going to talk about stepping down and so let's give a really simple example. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna set Carla up for talking about some recipes here. <laughs> so um, the spinach salad, the infamous spinach salad. Uh, I'll say right now, I am a woman in her 60s. And as a net result, when I was growing up, the only way I'd ever eaten spinach is boiled. Okay typical old-fashioned way of eating spinach was boiling it. We were actually removing some of the soluble oxalate by boiling it. So traditional cooking methods can sometimes have been taking oxalate down in a food. I hit my 20s, I'm really smart, I'm eating spinach salads. Okay, so if you are somebody who's been consuming a spinach salad or perhaps a spinach smoothie every day, day in, day out, as many of us now do, because we can get spinach 365 days a year. Um, what we want you to do is start to step down. Now, if you're going to try and step down slowly from the amount of oxalate that's in spinach, when there's, I think there's about three milligrams per gram of spinach, that's not going to be necessarily easy. So what about you take three quarters of your regular serving of spinach and use one quarter of something that's still high oxalate, but nowhere near as high as spinach, like curly kale. You've started the process of coming down. You're coming down slowly, or at least more slowly than if you just drop spinach out. So what if you slowly convert that serving of spinach to your curly kale. You're still high, but you're nowhere near where you were with the spinach. Then you start to peel out the curly kale serving and you start to sub in radish greens, or you start to sub in arugula, both of them very low in oxalate, still green. And then you slowly peel out that next layer. This gives you kind of a stair step approach to come down from whatever level you're at with that particular food that you're taking in every day. So if you're taking in something like that and you're doing it every day, this is the kind of thing we're talking about. You're at the highest level of oxalate when you're in that extremely high category. Find a comparable green in the very high or the high category. Slowly scrape out your extremely high one for your next stair step. Then scrape out that one with something that's a little lower again. Then scrape out that one down at the lowest and you will have gradually come down in oxalate without necessarily shocking your system um, like some of us did. And I'm gonna say one thing. Oh, and somebody said cream spinach. Thank you, Kelly. The, uh, we also ate cream spinach, which had the dairy in it, which gave you some additional minerals, which was sort of the antidote while you were taking in the poison. So we did lots of things traditionally, which actually, typically reduced oxalate in food. Um, so as you're bringing it down like that, you're not shocking the system. But even with some of those drops, you may see something called the honeymoon period. Well, I don't know if we've mentioned that in the last couple of videos, but the honeymoon period is you start to drop oxalate out and all of a sudden the angels are singing and everything's good and you feel like you haven't felt in ages. 
If you get that kind of an effect as you bring oxalate down and the only lever you pulled was oxalate, you didn't change anything else in your diet, you just pulled that oxalate lever, it's really a good sign that oxalate's probably at least part of what's going on for you. But just know that honeymoon period is not necessarily last forever. I had about, I think I had somewhere between a week and 10 days where I, the angels were singing and I hadn't felt that good in years. And then dumping started and then the next set of things started to happen. So for those of us who want to go more slowly, you may actually see some little honeymoon periods as you're coming down, right? But you may not get the bigger ones like those of us who, who nose dive got, but any time you're just pulling one lever, just the oxalate lever and everything else is staying the same, I think you can be pretty assured oxalate's what's going on. Okay, did I steal all your, your spinach talk, Carla? Or do you have some other no. one that you want to use? <laughs> I, I actually have two recipes, one with the one that I used last week which was with the almond flour. And then I decided to, to look at an eggs Florentine recipe. And let's just say that was an eye opener. At least this particular recipe was. So let me bring that up and share. Let's see, how do we do this? Okay, let me share, figure out how Patricia to may have to give you privileges to share. Yeah, she's doing that. Okay. Everything good? Okay, so this was the first one that we did, we talked about last week, which was a, a strawberry cookie bar and three cups of almond flour, as you can see, is roughly close to 2400 milligrams of oxalate in three cups <laughs> that just makes and, that just hurts even reading it go ahead <laughs> and you know so i you know i worked out here's how you got all your you know i, I worked out all the the calculations using the spreadsheet and the recipe calls for six you know it's gives you 16 bars, which is still 150 milligrams of oxalate per per bar. So, you know, that's, you know, a day or two-ish. But so, a good add-in, this would make a good add-in if somebody had a had gone to a baseline low oxalate and needed a few hundred bump up, right? Yep. Yep. So my hack was the only thing I changed was the almond flour. And I reduced it by a quarter or, or by a half cup and then threw in some brown teff flour, which is still pretty high. But, you know, if you notice, it's 394 milligrams per half cup of almond flour. So I, I put it by half, but if you, if you notice your overall intake per bar, it's dropped down a little. You know, you went from 150 to 147. Now, could you go a little bit more? You know, maybe yes, maybe no. But, you know, the goal is to go gradually. And, and yeah, this is, this is slow, but it's still, you know, you're still lowering it. Yeah. So that yeah. might be one way to do it, you know, or you could, you could go down to a lower, you know, uh, a flower that's, let's say very high, you know, like sorghum or, but if you want to go to a, a half cup, if you're going to lower from close to 400 milligrams per half cup, I would just, I, I would stick with the, the extremely high, but one that's, <laughs> considerably you know that's lower than your almond flour and your teff flowers can kind of get you there so that's one alternative now for the spinach <laughs> this one I, I i i cringed when i saw this 
Okay, so eggs Florentine. This recipe called for a pound of spinach, which is roughly 15 cups. And, and this is raw spinach, not the baby spinach, just the regular spinach. 75 milligrams per half cup. So in order to get to this one pound, you're basically multiplying 75 milligrams by 30, which gets you 15 cups. You know, you've got another, you know, English muffins, which were about 48 milligram. And this is how I got to the 48 milligram. Nutmeg, you know, there's a couple of couple of hacks you can do. The hollandaise sauce is negligible. I mean, it's basically eggs, butter, and either lemon juice or vinegar. So, you know, a half cup's not gonna not gonna be bad at all, but that's spinach. My hack, because looking at the spreadsheet, the highest, let's say usable green, you know, that's there wasn't anything really in the very high category. Curly kale is in the high category, but that's 18, 18, 19 milligrams. So that's a heck of a jump going from, you know, 75 milligrams and cutting that down. So it might be smarter to just, you know, reduce that quarter cup and you'll see it gets you nine to 10 milligrams. And Keep reducing by, by a quarter cup until you can get to the point to where you can start subbing in, you know, things like curly kale. And so it may take you a while to get there. So, you know, you could use that, you know, you could use this recipe and, you know, for I'd say a good month before you get to the you know, throwing in curly kale. Right. Or or if you're just going to reduce the amount of it, you could be subbing arugula as you as you're reducing because it's adding almost nothing. Right. So if you're coming down a quarter cup at a time, but you wanted to have the same volume of greens that you're using, you could be subbing in your arugula right off the bat and but just come down really small amounts. Um, I did find that because we were coming from quite high amounts, like I was probably averaging closer to a thousand milligrams of oxalate a day. Um, because we were eating spinach every day. We were eating almonds every day. We were, yeah, it was just crazy. Um, that we did handle dropping, like, because my kids did it more, well, my daughter did it hard like me, but my son did it softer because I'd learned a little something before he got on the diet. And um, we did, I, did, I was able to bring him down about a hundred uh, a week. So, you know, in some cases, some of these recipes may handle a bit more of a drop, but, um, you know, I really appreciate that you're going in such a, a small and nuanced way, Carla, because, you know, it's too easy to, to come down too hard and, uh, and, and go too fast if you're really, if you're fragile, right? If you're, your systems, yeah. Especially if you're going that high. I mean, one of the guys that, that I would, I worked with, he was a coworker uh, of my husband. They were a good 15, 1,500. And we were doing, you know, we started out 200 drop, 250, you know, and that was, that was way too fast. Mm. So, I mean, we pretty much stopped midstream and went, yep, throw some stuff back throw some stuff back in there. Let's try again and, and let's do 50. And right. Yeah, it was still unpleasant, but they were like, yeah, we can live with this. Yeah. You as know, long as it's manageable. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's not a whole lot of fun, but we understood that it wasn't going to be, but you know, it's not like shoot me, please. Yeah. So, yeah. 
I did have a client who arrived at um, their first consult with me who had been tracking their oxalate intake and they were a very methodical eater and they ate pretty much the same things every day and they'd been on paleo for a long time and this woman knew she was taking in 3300 milligrams of oxalate a day and she came down 10 milligrams a day by weighing and measuring everything so that took her and then she would stop if she had a big dump and then she'd pick up whether, so it took her just over a year to get to, I think about 150. I think she was pulling in at about 150. And then we started to do more things, but just, just so everybody who's listening gets an idea here, um, the advantage of her going that slowly was that she never had oxalate dumping that was unmanageable. Whenever she did start dumping, she would stop at that level or even add in maybe 10 to 30 milligrams of oxalate just to take her up a little bit. Then when the, when the dump was over, she'd start to come down again. So for those who have that level of discipline, not a bad way to do it. I just personally would not be able to to weigh and measure and eat the same thing every day for, for that much time. That would have made me crazy, but really worked for her. Yeah. And I just want to, um, to come in something that I think if people are watching us and they've been in the group, then you start seeing why the advice could vary enormously depending on where you are. So I think one of the one of the good things that could become kind of like a custom within the group could be, hi, I'm having this issue, but I'm coming from this level. This is my current level. And then we can tell you, you know, what to do to go from that level a bit lower. And that would also force everybody, I think, a little bit to start thinking about those levels, because I think a lot of the people are just afraid of the numbers. And you really shouldn't be. Whatever it is where you're eating right now, that's okay. It's just from there to start going down slowly. And then just, uh, you know, and then all of a sudden, a lot of things start making sense. So if you see somebody that's coming in at 3,300, you know, we're going to tell them, stick with your spinach for a while, dear. <laughs> Whereas somebody that is doing 70, we're going to say, don't mess with the spinach because it's, it's very high and you'll get over that, that, that level very, very quickly. And there's no need for it. So when you start seeing different types of comments from different list members, you also have to understand that it's because many people are coming from different places. So something that work, that's working for them it could be because they are at 2,500 and they're reducing the, you know, like they say, the spinach with the, with the kale or something. And then somebody else is going to go, oh my gosh, kale is so high and I'm so sick from it and whatever. Yes, because you're at a different level. So we just have to remember that not everybody's coming in with the same level. Not everybody's having the same tool kit in front of them they're not using the same strategies and uh and we're just going to have to be very open and receptive to the variety of things that people are using to get themselves to that lower level and uh and the other and just uh the other idea is that you have to remember that yes a low oxalate diet is 40 to 60 milligrams a day but that does not mean that if you are at 3300 and you go down to 3100 that you're not going to start seeing changes so you know I, the magic starts happening as you go down but it's not like you're going to have to spend a year feeling bad without seeing anything. And then, you know, eventually when you hit the 60 magic mark, then you're going to feel better. It's not like that. You are following, you know, the, the capacity of your body to get rid of this toxin. And as it comes down, you're going to start feeling better.
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And of course, greens are not the only place where people can have been too high and nor is almond flour the only place where people can have been too high. So whatever foods you've been consuming that are really high, um, one of the things that we did a lot of was tomato sauces because we love them. Um, and that's another place where you can have really uh, a lot more oxalate than you'd think because whatever oxalate you've got in that beautiful red tomato as it's cooking down and see, I see our moderator Kelly Cryer kind of I'm cringing a little here as you're cooking it down you're concentrating all that lovely oxalate in there and so one of the things you can do for those of you who do like sauces is start to cut your tomato sauce with butternut squash puree great texture holds the flavor nicely works in your pasta sauces without any problem so we had we were one of those people who canned some of our own and so I would take our pasta sauce and start to cut it with some butternut and so this was one place where I was a little bit smarter than I was with some of our other <laughs> our other changes where I just went "Ooh, oxalate bad let's get rid of that as quickly as possible but now um, I've got various recipes where you actually have a low oxalate sauce for pasta where you've got some tomato component, but it, you're just not, you're not hitting it with the kind of oxalate level as just straight tomatoes, the spices and cooked down. But there's all kinds of ways where you can take something like that and adulterate it just a little bit. So if you would normally take a jar of your canned sauce at home, or maybe you would cook two jars for your family. Maybe you cook a jar and a half and the other half is butternut squash, or maybe it's maybe it's one of the other higher oxalate squashes because you don't wanna come down too fast. Again, this sort of nuanced dance that we have to do with some of these ingredients. Um, what was another one that we did? We we did we did like spinach so that was one where where i did try to do some of one and some of another but we also had a problem where my husband really loved kale and he didn't want to give up kale and this was when we were actually like i had already gotten us as low as i could the only thing that saved us is i made some mistakes so our oxalate kept jumping up intermittently so that helped us not suffer as much as we might have otherwise so um you know i i mixed up our kale selection with the curly kale. So that gave us some higher oxalate things periodically. And, you know, that is another way where you can, where you can get at some of this. Like once you're pulling into the lower end, you may want to have like an intermittent bump up day where you take in a bit higher oxalate and see if you can slow dumping down. But Everybody here should be aware that at some point in the process, that trick stops working. And it stops working because you've gotten rid of enough of the oxalate load inside your body that your body's not going to play anymore when you add extra into the gut. It's just going to mean you've got more oxalate moving. So um, I think in our case, we were able to bump up oxalate and slow dumping maybe for about a year might have been a little longer than that. I can't remember exactly now because it's 14 years ago now almost. Um, but, you know, we also have to be thinking while we're doing this nuance drop, thinking about whatever supplements we might want to use, whatever other kinds of strategies we might want to use to manage the symptoms that you get with dumping, because it's all about it being manageable. It's not none of us here got rid of oxalate without dumping we all had to go through that and that's part of the process because the oxalate moves out of the tissues like a wave into the bloodstream your body has to clear it and so this is this is how it happens so it's not that dumping is bad we get these people on the groups um on the triangle oxalate support groups who are trying to avoid dumping like it is you know, death itself. We're all going to do some dumping. It's all about manageability of the symptoms. So, you know, I don't want anybody here to think that dumping is somehow 
um, to be avoided at all costs. It's really, it's just part of how you're going to get rid of oxalate. You just don't, you want your dumping to be the orderly eviction of unwanted tenants. You don't want the stampede. <laughs> Got stuff to add, Carla? You had mentioned butternut squash, uh, another alternative, pumpkin. We used pumpkin puree, uh, another alternative is making more of, let's say a cream sauce with tomato paste. And, and what, you know, if you're, you're not dairy free, then, then heavy cream, you know, you still get the the tomato flavor, but you know, a tablespoon or two of of tomato paste is fairly manageable. Or, you know, let's say you want to have a little more than then use a little bit of just plain tomato sauce, throw in some little oxalate spices, you know, watch the watch the serving size or, or and the amount that you're using. And you know, there's said there's a couple of different ways to hack it and again with the dumping you know I'll, I'll just keep a green it's it's not something you're going to be able to avoid it, it should be more yeah this isn't fun but I can live with it you know it should not be debilitating you know that is the last thing that we want. And, you know, I, I remember there was a guy on the Yahoo group that ended up in the ER. He had already, I think he had went kind of cold turkey from a very high, high level. He had thrown chocolate back in. He had thrown spinach and chard back in. He had thrown yams back in and nothing, nothing was working. And his pain level was just, was just through the roof. And somebody had to take him to, to the ER because, you know, it, he was in agony and his blood pressure readings were, were through the roof. We really don't want anyone to experience anything close to that. I mean, it should be like, ow, as opposed to, you know, I, I need a straitjacket because I'm in that much pain. You know, it should be more irritating, slightly uncomfortable than anything else. Yeah, yeah manageability is the, is the name of the game. Ma yes. Manageability. It's... We're not going to be able to totally control this, but we can definitely use techniques so that we're not throwing ourselves under the bus in this process. Absolutely. Um, another thing that you can do for another one of those classics, which is potatoes. Uh, in my home, it's uh, mashed potatoes are like a staple. And of course, it, you get a whole lot of potatoes in just a little serving because you know, you're, you're just mashing the whole thing. And uh, one of the things that worked for us was cauliflower. So it would start just adding a little bit of cauliflower to the potatoes and then eventually became a lot more cauliflower than potato. And uh, it comes to the point where right now for a whole pot of, you know, cauliflower, which is probably a cauliflower and a half, I would use a small red potato in there and it will give you the, the consistency of the mashed potatoes, but you will be eating something else. And now my husband absolutely adores it because it's easier to digest as well. So um, there's uh, different ways. The other thing is that we used to use um, other things so that they would not be only eating potatoes. So we would start, yes, with carrots and put, you know, little pieces of carrot and bacon and just have like, it's a Belgian stump. That's what it's called, where you put different things. Or we would put different types of vegetables in there. And of course, the vegetables will be going from high 
to lower, to lower, to lowest. So um, it's just a process and it's something that it's doable if you think a little bit outside of the box. And just um, to, uh, we have nine minutes left. So just say, why do I have to go through pain and inflammation and high blood pressure and all these things? You know, why don't I just keep eating high oxalate and I don't, you know, forget about it? And uh, this is a really irritating thing. Monique already called inflammasome, you know, that signal organelle in the cell that's going to say, alert, alert, everybody go on DEFCON 5, you know, and just be, be, uh, be careful. So when on the other side of the dump, you know, everybody kept saying, we all have to dump whatever. I love when I'm dumping. But it's not the moment when I'm dumping, it's I'm curious to what's going to happen right after. Because what's going to happen right after is exactly why you're doing it. So you're going to start feeling better. You're going to start concentrating better. You're going to move better. You're going to have more flexibility. You're going to sleep better. You're going to, you know, there's going to be a ton of things. So um you're just going to have to remember that, yes, we have to go through dumps. We're trying to make the dumps by these explanations as manageable as possible so that, yeah, you see sandy stools. Yes, you feel the little grains, you know, everywhere. Then, uh, you know, the little pimples or whatever. But then on the other side, yeah, the little um, sand on your on your eyes, the coughing with the muck, you know, with the whitish, um, the mucus, mucus. Yeah. mucus. And, uh, and it's just, you know, but at the other side, you always see improvements. And, uh, and that's what's really the driver for this whole thing, because everybody wants to feel better. Everybody wants to be in great health, feel healthy, not feel, you know, not have that slump after eating or that inflammation after eating or that pain or that whatever so um I, I just thought it was important because everybody keeps saying oh dumping is terrible no that what's right after dumping is worth every dump yes it's it's okay. the waltz this is the waltz with oxalate right two steps forward next dump one step back but then two steps forward so yeah we haven't talked enough about that every time i've gone through an oxalate dump at the other end it was better energy level better like like uh, patricia was saying focus better i was so frustrated with brain fog and not even being able to remember common words like i still remember sitting across the table from my then um three and a half year old daughter and going give me that thing in front of you. And she looks at me, cocks her head and goes, mama, the book? Like, I'm like you can't say book. <laughs> it would just could not get that word out. So, you know, then I would have another dump and it would be like, oh, the brain's working and I'm sleeping better and I feel better and I have more energy and I can, I can live my life. What we want is our lives back, right? Exactly. I didn't love dumping. I'll be the first person to tell you, hate it. <laughs> Hated going through it. Hated seeing, especially seeing the kid go through it. But it helps to keep things into perspective to know that if, you know, like they said, you know, this ain't pleasant, but at the end, it's worth there it. will be improvements, you know, and, and it may not be huge improvements at first but they you know the improvements will continue to grow when we first started the diet you know the first six months we were probably dumping more than we weren't you know we would dump for a couple of weeks we'd have a couple of days you know maybe a week that that were good and then the process would start all over again but the longer we stayed on the diet, you know, pretty soon it was two weeks of, of good times. Then it was three weeks. Then it was four weeks. You know, then it was two or three months. You know, then it was, you know, six months. I think the last time I, the last time I had a dump was three, four years ago. Yeah, for me, it's definitely and, years. And, and it was because I had, 
willingly hopped off the bandwagon, you know, the, the low oxalate wagon and, and went, you know what, that loaded baked potato, ooh, that looks good. And, and I threw on the butter, the sour cream and the cheese and about six hours later, oh God, just shoot me now. <laughs> and, you know, my kid did the same thing. Someone gave him one of those grandma peanut butter cookies. So, you know, that are about like that big. And he was like, eh, I don't care. I'm, you know, I'm gonna have it. I like peanut butter, you know. I don't care that it's got gluten. You know, what's the worst that can happen? And a couple hours later, he's like, uh, I'm in some serious pain, Ma. What do I do? Suck it up, son. You know, and at this point, he was 13. So he knew better. And it was like, you know, here's some extra magnesium. Here's, you know, here, here's a little more, a little more calcium, but and, you know, go hop in an Epsom salt bath, but you know what? You're going to be a hurting puppy for a couple of days. You know, what have you learned? Well, maybe not to have that entire cookie. Maybe I just break that cookie up into six pieces. No, <laughs> but you know, you've got the right idea. Yeah, exactly. Kelly, you want to say something? Yeah, can y'all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, cool. Okay. Two quick things. So I'm actually in a little honeymoon period right now. Mine currently only lasts about eight hours, <laughs> but about this time last week, I had started one that was bad from my head. And then uh, overnight last night, I think my body figured it out. So like right now I feel great. Um, that'll end here. Who knows in an hour, two, three, four hours, is usually how it goes, <laughs> but I'm, you know, just for anyone watching, I'm, I'm, way behind the ball than these three ladies. I'm, I'm the newbie. So I'm still in, in the throes of it. And um, the other thing I wanted to say real quick, when y'all were talking about, um, you know, when people come on the group, watch this video and they go, well, so why would I even lower them? That sounds like that's a terrible experience. And it's that the other thing we've learned and y'all, you know, step in and correct me if I'm wrong, is that if you choose to go that method of, well, I don't think I'm having bad enough symptoms right now. I'll just keep eating the way I am. Eventually your time runs out or, you know, you get in a car accident or you have a child or you do something traumatic, something traumatic happens to you. And this stuff just comes rushing out in a very uncontrolled manner. Or maybe just with age, you hit a point to where your body can't deal with it anymore. And so it comes out again and you can't, you don't have as much control. And that's on top of other reasons you would want to do this on your own terms. But um, that was an important lesson for me to learn in the beginning of it kind of, I, I was lucky that I kind of got to choose for this to happen. Whereas maybe somebody else again gets in a car accident and it's three times as bad as it needs to be because on top of the injuries of the accident, this is happening, you know? So those are my two thoughts. We're doing it for the benefits in the long run. When I found this diet and I've told the story before, I was 48, my youngest was three, my oldest was eight, and I did not think I'd live to see them grow up. I am now staring down the barrel of 62 in about a month. And, you know, I'm healthier and happier and have better energy and, and the, you know, a life I really love. And I was not feeling like that when I started this. So we do this for the benefits. Yeah. And every time you dump, I, I remember insomnia was my big thing. I would, I would start into dumping. I would wake up about one, one 30 in the morning. I'd be awake until like four, four 30 in the morning. I'd fall asleep maybe for an hour, an hour and a half. And then I'd get up with my little kids. No <laughs> way I'd have to go. And after the first couple of dumpings, when I realized that after a dumping, I would feel better, even if it was only for a short time period. Every time I dumped then and I would have that terrible middle of the night insomnia, I would watch funny reruns of old comedies on TV. And I would say to myself, better out than in. I'm going to feel better after this is over. It's going to be okay. I've come through it every time. So there is a process here where we have to kind of coach ourselves and and be able to be our own best friends as we go through this process. So, you know, we've all talked about it here, nuance, you know, gentleness with your body, come down slowly, 
think a little bit about where you're at. When you, when you first learned about Oxlate, you know, we want to encourage people to, to learn about it and then kind of plan your way forward. Yeah, life will happen. Stuff will, stuff will occur that you're not ready for. You'll have to have a plan B. But let's just think a little bit about nuance and dancing with what you're doing. So for any of you folks who ballroom dance, you get up on the dance floor to do the waltz. Yeah, two steps forward, one back. You're going to go around in circles. You might go around in a lot of circles in the process of getting across the dance floor, but you'll get there, right? Absolutely. And with that, it's been an hour, Wizard. So we're just going to call it a day. Thank you so much for joining us. And we're going to be posting this on the Wizards of Ox YouTube channel. So please remember to subscribe so that you can to, you know, click on the little bell so that you get a notification every time we post something. We really hope that these are helpful and, um, and that it gives you a little bit of perspective. For me, just to close, I mean, it was so good after the dumps. And with my kid, it was so spectacular spectacular you know the the kinds of things that i that i never dreamed i would see that you know if i had to do it all over again i would it just it's just been that good a ride it's been incredible you know when you have somebody that ha that they tell you is, or it's never going to talk and all of a sudden tells you water you're you're and you know you're just so happy but then when they turn around and go oh boy it's hot I'm thirsty you're blown away and you're just like oh my gosh this is I will do it all over again so hang in there and uh, hang in there low and slow remember this is a low oxygen diet but the exercise is in lowering our own oxalate level you do not go low oxalate from you know to today to tomorrow so see you next week. And uh, Monique, do you want to tell us about what we're going to talk about next week? Uh, well, for those of you who are stumbling into the world of not only oxalate, but histamine, and maybe you've come from oxalate to histamine, or maybe you've come from histamine to oxalate, and who are also dealing with things like salicylate, we're going to talk a little bit about um, how our individual oxalate journeys have gone. Um, sometimes you can do an uncomplicated lower your oxalate and all is good. Sometimes you stumble into histamine and sometimes you stumble into both histamine and salicylate. And so each one of us has a slightly different journey here with our own families. And we'll talk a little bit about that and why oxalate could be a confounding factor in all of these uh, issues that can turn up in your diet. But if you're in that place right now, we will be back to talk about it next week. Okay. And so we'll just say goodbye and see you next week then. <laughs>